Hello and welcome to the Stansberry Investor Hour. I'm Dan Ferris. I'm the editor of Extreme Value and the Ferris Report, both published by Stansberry Research. And I'm Corey McLaughlin, editor of the Stansberry Daily Digest. Today we're going to talk with the rebel capitalist George Gammon. And Corey and I will talk about the latest personal consumption expenditures report and what it means. And remember, if you want to ask us a question or tell us what's on your mind, email us at feedback at investorhour.com. That and more right now on the Stansberry Investor Hour. PCE, PCE, personal consumption expenditures, is the Federal Reserve's preferred inflation gauge. So it's worth watching. Not CPI. Yeah. N- not not CPI. CPI. Not the, uh, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Not, not the consumer price index, the personal consumption expenditures index. And so CPI peaked in 2022 at like 9.1%. PCE was 5.6%. Okay. So they're, they're different numbers. They measure slightly different things. And it's not worth going into all the details of that. However, um, the recent PCE report was slightly lower than the previous monthly PCE report. The previous one was in February was 2.78%. This one came in at 2.75%. So a little bit lower and just a continuing trend of lower 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 numbers in actually CPI and PCE pretty consistently for the past, I don't know, 20 months or something. Um, yeah. Yeah. So inflation's licked, right? <laughs> uh, Loaded yes question. No, I guess, yeah. depending right. on what you look at. I, yeah. I like to look at the, so in the monthly number for PCE, which is what I've been paying attention to lately too, because at the end of last year, the month over month inflation was like flat to, you know, barely, barely anything. But January was 0.4%. And then February, with the numbers we're talking about, uh, was 0.3%, which is above, you know, simple math, above target for the Fed's so called 2% inflation target. So when you hear the Fed say, you know, inflation's done, you know, high inflation's done, or they're signaling, I haven't said that, but signaling it, right? Yeah. That rate cuts are coming. Um, you know, it's, if you look at the last couple months, it doesn't look like that. And and a lot of it has to do with, with energy prices, oil prices. Um, you know, there are pockets of like deflation in this data too. So I think that's what they're looking at too. Um, yeah. The Fed is, but, but when you look at the, uh, you know, overall, like there, everything's different for every person, right? So everybody has a different budget. Companies have different costs. Like it's not, there's not a, a cut and dry answer uh, for, a single answer for everybody. So, you know, depending on what your costs are, you're going to have a different answer. Um, But it's not like high inflation is dead forever in my estimate. I would say so too. And I would say that we're, um, we could be on the verge of making a pretty big mistake here. It could be the, you know, the Arthur Burns moment um, from the seventies where, um, you know, they thought they were, they were okay and and weren't you know inflation was kind of up uh, up into the right but in a sinusoidal pattern so it was up and then it was down and then it was up higher and then it was down not quite as low and then it was up way higher um and it was really really difficult um but uh, an issue here um kind of cropped up for me recently because uh one of our former guests on the show, Mike Green from Simplify Asset Management. Um, he's got a little Substack thing that he writes. Um, little, it's pretty big actually. <laughs> he's got a lot of. He packs it with a lot of data, and he thinks he said something. He said that interest rates are a terrible way to fight inflation, and of course, they sort of do make things more expensive. When you raise interest rates, you make housing more expensive, don't you? And you make anything credit related more expensive. So um, I kind of see where he's coming from, but he's got this list in his latest Substack. He says, you know, we've all been saying that 
Um, the Fed is going to raise rates until they break something. He said, well, they didn't really break anything. He said, after all, nothing has broken except five major bank failures, commercial real estate collapse, auto sales down, home sales down, marginally unemployed and unemployed up by a million people, full-time unemployment flat for almost two years, uh, native-born U.S. employment down one million. And for what it's worth, the median stock is down 4%. <laughs> so, you know, the median stock being like the maybe the um, the equal weight S&P 500 right. could be a proxy yeah. for that. So, <laughs> you know, nothing's broken except for those eight things. Um, so nothing yeah. serious. Yeah, bank failures. Yeah, those, those little bank failures that were bigger in, right. you know, nominally than the whole financial crisis. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah. And, and many have pointed to the, including the Fed itself, have pointed to the lagging nature of monetary policy and interest rate policy. So, you know, um, there's there. Mike has a point, um, and I, I and I feel like too often, and I've 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 had this issue before. I had it during the, um, you know, in March of 2020 during the COVID thing when I said this is going to happen, that's going to happen, and you are going to get a crash. They're going to shut things down, blah, blah, blah. And people thought I meant that that's what should be done. <laughs> no, I'm not saying what should be done. I'm saying what I think will probably happen. And I'm trying to get inside the Fed's head, you know, to just sort of ask, what are they thinking? Because um, it is it is thought by many, many people. There is always a reaction to these monetary policy moves. Uh, it is thought by many, many people that this is a very consequential thing in the world um, and that it's worth watching and that it is a way to fight inflation. So it, and it's hard to constantly remind people that you're kind of sussing out the narrative as well as the reality of what's going to happen in the market because of that. So I don't know. I, I don't know if I've made yeah. myself clearer or worse, but that's, that's what yeah, it it's, is. It, well, it's, I, I see his point too. I see Mike's point too, because um, you know, obviously the interest rates have the most direct impact on interest rate sensitive areas of the economy, right? Like anything, right. you know, loans, car loans, uh, real estate, uh, mortgages. Um, but that makes, you know, expenses a lot. Like if say a company wants to invest in something like a piece of machinery or something, it makes it a lot more expensive to do that for that for that company. Um, and then what are they going to do? They're probably, you know, probably going to have to raise prices or, you know, especially if they're paying people more because of the tight labor market, which goes back to all the stimulus from the pandemic. And right. um, so, yeah, it's hard to fight trillions of dollars in fiscal stimulus, I think, with higher interest rates. Right. And certainly, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and certainly an inverted curve suggests um, what Mike also pointed out, which is kind of a, an obvious thing. Uh, fooling with the short term rates doesn't necessarily affect long term investment decisions. I mean, certainly mortgage rates have gone up, but, you know, any anything else that, you know, a triple A company pegged on the 10 year um, like they're not paying a whole lot more necessarily. Um, so it, it's, it's a good point. He makes a fair point. You know, we focus on this thing and, and it looks like, well, we buy the narrative. This is a good, you know, this is the way to do this and this is what's going to happen, but not necessarily. Uh, and, and, you know, you talked about, um, a moment ago about, you know, the prospect for raising prices and higher wages and stuff. And indeed a recent headline at dailyshot.com was, after a pullback, more U.S. firms are boosting sales prices. So th so these increases are still washing through, and more U.S. firms are now boosting their prices to, to adjust for them. The higher wages, higher costs, could even be lingering supply chain problems. Um, yeah. But but yeah. Yeah, prices aren't going down. I, I, I don't think right. anybody will, <laughs> will listening to this will think that. So yeah, and, and um, that's right. A lower PCE and a lower CPI, as long as it's a positive number, prices are still going up. And right, 
you know, they're going it's up been by positive. more. It's, it's, it's still positive, you know, right now. So it's not like prices are going down. It's no, it's, it's I don't know. It's whatever the, it, it, the numbers and the data appear to be good enough for the fed to justify cutting rates is all it is in my mind. Like that's really all it is. Um, and I'm with you. I think we're on a path of, like we said l- last week, like growth's pick GDP's picking up. They're projecting unemployment to the rate to stay about the same. And we're cutting rates um, while inflation numbers are, or they're talking about cutting rates while the, like those monthly inflation numbers have been picking up, you know, compared to the end of last year. So, you know, I don't know, maybe they know something we don't, but. Um, <laughs> well, they certainly, it's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, there's a lot of, it, it's a question. There's a lot of questions. I think a lot of people on like mainstream will be like, okay, inflation's inflation's dead. Why am I paying 30% more for, you know, whatever, or 70%. I've been getting notes from people, 70, 80% more in insurance premiums. Like, yep. Um, you know, those, everybody pays insurance, right? Like, yeah. so, and it's just, that's one of the things like you don't cut uh, from your expenses or you do it last. And so, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, there's a lot of, a lot of questions, you know, that, that are not new when it comes to like monetary policy versus like what's actually going on with, with people's lives. But, um, yeah, after this run of inflation that we've had, it's just, it's apparent just once again. It is. And you can sort of see it in, you know, you can kind of see it everywhere, right? Gold's up, dollar up, stock market up, um, to a certain extent rates down a little bit. Um, so, you know, it's, um, it's, it's the everything, you know, like the everything bubble is still here. I feel like, and they're talking about cutting rates. It just, I'm, I'm really curious, you know, is gold saying, Hey, um, gold hitting new all time highs, you know, 2200 an ounce or so is yeah. gold saying, Hey, be careful here because they might break something the other direction too. Right. You yeah. can, you can yeah. break things Maybe. in both directions. Right. <laughs> right. But, yeah. So, I mean, gold's looking like the price action is looking like it was it in kind of the middle of 2020 when I think people realized that inflation was going to be an issue. Um, yeah. People outside of the central bank, at least, were talking about, you know, mm-hmm. to me, that's what it looks like. I mean, yeah, you're right. Gold's up. What was it at? I'm looking at a chart right now. It was at around 2000 as recently as like a month ago. Now it's up 20 above 2200. So, yeah. Yeah. Not a, not an insignificant move. No, not an insignificant move at all. And, um, you know, I'll point out again that the gold miners ha- have, they've moved, but they're still kind of behind gold substantially. If you look over the past couple of years, gold has moved very nicely and gold miners are like down some of them a lot. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> last, you know, I, I, I put a chart in one of my newsletters, I guess it must've been the Ferris report that showed the price of gold versus the price of Newmont mining. Now, whatever problems they have as a company aside, like, down 50% on Newmont versus up, you know, what, I think it was 11 or 12% in the time period I chose with gold just didn't make a lot of sense. It, and, and it's with all gold stocks are generally down compared to gold. So I don't know. I still think there's an opportunity there and I don't think gold is a bubble at all. I, I think gold is doing its job because it's not going up, you know, it's not doubling and tripling. It's just kind of moving up by low double digits. Um, yep. you know, suggesting and it's done its job in the last couple of years too. You exactly. Know, you know, yeah. While, while people, are like, why isn't gold higher? Why isn't gold higher? Well, it's, it's where it should be. Like it's where it should be. It's, it's not going anywhere. It, yeah. You know, it's, it's, uh, yeah. it's doing its job like it's done for centuries. And so, um, it's working once again and central banks are buying gold. You know why? You know, they're like a huge buyer right now. So yeah. what does That's that right. tell you? I mean, it's, it's, it's um yeah retailers are selling yeah. it actually the retail investors are kind of they're selling and you know shares of the publicly traded trusts are being redeemed so you know the i don't know i don't know if you call central banks smart money but it's certainly big money it's certainly move the right. market kind of money in gold so 
Um, right. They're, they're the buyers, which is interesting, at least. I don't know how scary it is, but it is interesting that they yeah. think gold is worth buying um, because their resources are usually devoted to buying, you know, the Fed's usually resources are devoted to buying U.S. securities, right? <laughs> so um, if a central bank is buying gold, that's interesting. And, and you know, especially the, the non-U.S. central banks buying gold, you know, instead of dollars, maybe. That's yeah. very, very interesting to me. Yes, me too. Mm. And which is happening, uh, yeah. you know, a lot. And it, it it plays into that whole dollar story. You know, we don't think the dollar's, you know, crashing tomorrow. But, like, you know, I think, you know, chip away, chip away, chip away. And um, that may, it, you know, this may be all part of that, too. Like, um, that that whole story, so. And if we if we get like another run of inflation again, it's like the same. I don't know. It's like the same argument as, as that we've had two three years ago. From you know, just I don't know. I see the same thing playing out again. It's not. Right. This is not new. It's, sure. it's just right. kind of prepare. <clears throat> expect for. I don't know. Expect. We've said this so many times. Like just expect for higher than usual inflation. To me, I mean, it's right. Is this like a? Like. Is this a second leg up? In other words. Right. Yeah. I hope, you know, we all hope not. Nobody, <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people um, with a lot more modest means than us are tired of paying a lot more than they were paying a couple of years ago. So, yep. you know, fingers crossed. Um, but, <laughs> but hope is not a strategy. <laughs> fingers crossed, but hope is not a strategy. So you better right. prepare for it. You better do something. Yep. Um, yeah. So, one thing that I, I actually, um, I just got an email from our colleague and recent guest, Dave Lashmit, and we were talking about something that he talked about during his interview. And I just wanted to mention it real mm -hmm. quick. We don't, you know, we don't have to spend a lot of time on it, but um, he talked about the, the winter switch, how cold weather um, burns up calories, basically, and and you're, we're teaching our bodies not to do this by staying warm all the time. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't live out in the, out in the cold, like primitive humans did. Uh, and I, and he, he pointed to an article about this. I said, Oh, wow. It sounds like, um, cold exposure is good for you. And Dave shot back and said, yep. He said, we've eliminated climate control as a metabolic, as a metabolic need. So we don't burn, um, 500, I think that's kilocalories, staying warm every day times 365 days times, you know, 25 years or whatever it is. So, um, yeah, we're fatter because we're warmer, which is weird. I mean, I yeah. thought, I yeah, thought no, people yeah. moved to warm climates and got fit, you know, <laughs> in their old age, right? They, they try to stay fit. They move to a warm climate, but maybe it doesn't work that way. Well, not if you sit in air conditioning all day long, and, <laughs> that's right. um, you know, you're not moving around outside. Like, yeah, yeah. that's the, we're talking about the weight loss story, weight loss drug story that Dave's been talking about. Yeah. And um, yeah, just why the, like, uh, the demand for, for these drugs. Yes. I mean, culturally, we've gotten to this point where yeah. we, all of our comforts have, are, are making us larger. And uh, I think, and so. Yeah. Or get, at least present making it easier to to uh, to do that. And, right. uh, as we sit and indoors in front of microphones. As we, right. I mean, really, as I <laughs> what are we doing here? Yeah. Dave wrote we, we I worked with Dave on another digest last week about about all this. And as I was reading it, I, I was like, oh, we literally needed to invent forms of exercise to like make up for what he's talking about. You know, if you sat outside on a winter day or summer day or whatever, mm -hmm. you'd kind of naturally burn calories that you wouldn't otherwise. I mean, we have to invent going to the gym or lifting weights or <laughs> just things right. that like the amount, what was it? The stat was like 2% of the American population is now like farmers or agricultural work. And mm -hmm. in the past that had been like 90, what, 5% or something. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's like not, that's a huge change. I yeah, mean, that's, it is. and we wonder why we're, why obesity is a problem. 
like i mean it's when you look at it that way why you know 100 years ago we were an agricultural based economy now we're this like service based at the top you know economy um yeah, we gotta buy gym memberships when we could just you know right. throw a log over something or whatever but like um it's yeah no it is that, that story's not going away that that the uh obesity epidemic and weight loss drugs all right just wanted to mention that i think it's interesting yeah. and and it will certainly be a topic on the show for some time to come it looks like um but let's talk with today's guest george gammon we've been looking to get him on the show for a little while uh, we had him scheduled he had a little hiccup coming back through customs from being out of the country so we had to reschedule the recording and we finally got him in front of a microphone and finally got him in front of a camera um very interesting guy a very top-down macro oriented um economic thinker with a lot of interesting ideas so let's talk with him let's talk with george gammon let's do it right now the 2024 stansbury research conference and alliance meeting is back this fall in las vegas and for the first time ever they've extended their early bird discounted ticket pricing which means if you reserve your seat today you can save $450 off your ticket. Head over to www.vegasearlybird.com to find all the details and get your discounted ticket. The Stansbury Conference is truly one of the best business mixed with pleasure industry events out there. Past speakers have included Shark Tank's Kevin O'Leary, Dennis Miller, and Steve Forbes. And, of course, all your favorite Stansberry editors will be there, too, including yours truly. I mean, I hope I'm one of your favorites. <laughs> I look forward to this event every year. It's great getting the chance to meet our listeners from the show, whether it's chatting during a break or grabbing a beer at the end of the day or whatever. So I hope you're planning to join us. It's a great event. Go to www.vegasearlybird.com to get your discounted ticket before prices increase. That's www.vegasearlybird.com. So come on out and find me in Vegas and say hello. George, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Well, thank you for having me. Super excited to dive in. Yeah, I, um, I love the prospect of talking to a self-described macro addict at this particular moment <laughs> in time. Yeah. Yeah, self-described. And i uh, like to point out that I'm uh, uneducated. I've never taken a business class. I've never taken an econ class, never taken a finance class. And I almost flunked out of high school. So if I can do it, anybody can. These days, um, not being formally educated in a discipline is a is a serious flex, you know. It used to be you, that yeah. one bragged about one's credentials in that regard, but eh, not so much anymore. <laughs> yeah, I actually do think it was a benefit to start that way, oh, yeah. just because I started with a clean slate. And the only thing that I had at my disposal was just good old fashioned common sense. Well, yeah, it's not not real common. To, it's, it seems less common than ever, <laughs> depending on the topic yeah. nowadays. Yeah. Uh, but we'll we'll stay away from the uh, thornier topics like politics and religion, and we'll stick with finance. Um so how did you, since, since it wasn't the product of formal education, how did you become a, a self-described macro addict? Well, I retired in 2012. And when I retired, I, you know, I wasn't a, a billionaire by any stretch, but I had enough money in the bank to where if I invested it and got maybe a five or 6% return, I'd never have to worry about going back to work if I didn't want to. Nice. So I didn't, as an entrepreneur, I didn't want to delegate that to a financial planner. I wanted to take the bull by the horns myself. Mm -hmm. So I started really studying. And the more I studied, the more I fell in love with macro and economics, whatever you want, whatever you want to call it. And you know, what really was the catalyst was a trip I took to Singapore. This would have mm -hmm. been back at the end of 2012. Yep. And I was in the Marina Bay Sands. I remember it like it was yesterday. And I had about 10 minutes before a dinner date. And so I'm like, oh, you know, I'm just scrolling through YouTube really quick, looking at some of the videos. And I stumbled upon Milton Friedman's Free to Choose series. 
that he did back in, I believe it was on PBS in the late what? 70s, early 80s. And I just went straight down the rabbit hole. And everything he was saying made so much sense to me, even though I'd never studied it. At the time, I didn't know what the Federal Reserve was. I didn't know what the yield curve was. I knew nothing about this. But based on my experience as an entrepreneur and as an employee my whole life, everything that Milton Friedman was saying made perfect sense. It's like he was able to articulate exactly what had been in my mind for the past, call it, you know, 30 years. And uh, from Milton Friedman, I went to Thomas Sowell and still one of my favorite economists. In fact, I got basic economics right above me there. Yeah. And uh, then I started to get into the investors like Jim Rogers, Jim Grant, Doug Casey, Rick Rule, Schiff. Uh, fortunately, and you know, I've been blessed and now I've, I've been able to meet and hang out with a lot of these guys uh, that I still consider mentors in the space. But that's how it all started. And once I went down that rabbit hole, I just became fascinated by it. And I was trying to understand how it all works. And uh, it got to the point where I was just reading books or listening to podcasts like eight, 10 hours a day. And uh, I, I learned quite a bit. And then just through the exploration process of getting to a point where I didn't understand something and then just stopping obsessing over it until I figured it out. It's just kind of that iteration process has brought me to where I am today. All right. What'd you do before you retired? I was an entrepreneur for many years. The last business that I had was a convention business mm -hmm. uh, that we do two to three times per year. I say a convention, but it had about 5,000 people per event. So it was like, uh, logistically, it was like a military operation. I do a conference now called Rebel Capitalist Live, but it's like 500 people. So <laughs> doing something like that is child's play compared to what I used to do. Yeah, we do one of those every year. And, uh, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't want to be in charge of it. It's, it's too much. Um, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so you were also a self-described libertarian. Um, have yeah. you, have you always described yourself that way or is that fairly recent? That's an interesting question. So politics was never discussed in my family. Never, 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 never. Wow. Well, I take that back. It was discussed once for about 30 <laughs> seconds. Yeah. And my, my father, uh, was very old when I was born. He was 59, believe it or not. And uh, he actually flew planes in World War II in the Philippines. And uh, actually, to this day, I still wear uh, his dog tags. That's, that's not a replica. That's the actual dog tags that he wore in the 1940s flying planes in the Philippines and cool. being shot down three times, by the way. Wow. And so he was born in 1914. And uh, this was toward the end of his life. He passed away when he was 92. And I was sitting with him watching television, and we were just – stumbled across like the history channel or some show on past presidents. Mm -hmm. So I thought to myself, you know, dad has seen a lot of presidents uh, being born in 1914 and a lot of the presidents that are now iconic. So I said, dad, who is your favorite president? And he looked at me and he always called me Georgie boy. And he <laughs> says, Georgie boy, none of them. Good for him. I said, come on, come on, Dad. There, there had to be one president that you liked, for heaven's sakes. You know, uh, FDR, Reagan. I mean, somebody. He goes, no, none of them. I go, why? And he looked at me, and he just stared right into my eye, and he said, because they're all crooks. <laughs> and that was the only conversation that I ever had <laughs> with any of my family members about politics. But what was interesting is after my father passed in 2005, we had a Gammon family reunion. Mm -hmm. And this was in, uh, in Monterey. And it was probably 2007, 2008, something like that. And we had about I mean, at least 150 people there. And I mean, cousins, uh, all of these relatives that I, I hadn't seen in years, or maybe I'd only seen one or two times in my entire life. And we all get together and, you know, every once in a while you kind of bring up politics. And I'm not kidding you. Every single person there, although we had never discussed it and we weren't born and raised in the same area, 
uh, often, you know, different sides of the country, often in different countries altogether. They were all libertarian, every wow. single one of them. Wow. I mean, I was absolutely shocked. And up until that point, I had never really thought about politics. And no one, I don't think, would ever consider themselves a quote unquote libertarian within my family. But every single one of us disliked the government. <laughs> and we, we just wow. have this natural inclination. I don't know, it's something genetic, maybe. Yeah. Where we, anything, you know, central, centrally planned, uh, central control, central power, we just try to avoid it like the plague. And mm -hmm. I thought that was really interesting. But after that, there were a couple of events in my life that really opened up my eyes. Uh, one of them is I got into a big battle with the AG in uh, Connecticut. I won't go into details, but this was back in 2009. And prior to that, I thought what happened to me and, and the way he played the game happened only in China <laughs> or in Russia or in you know one of these countries where uh, you've got all this corruption. And what I realized is we have just as much corruption in the United States, if not more. It's just instead of the, the type of corruption where you're paying a cop $20 to get out of a ticket, uh, it's institutionalized corruption uh, that is, you know, comes to you wearing a Brioni suit. Right. And uh, so that's when I think I started to think about it even more. And I came to the conclusion that, yes, this is definitely the camp that I fall into. Also, when I started studying economics, you know, it was impossible not to get involved with uh, Ron Paul back then. Uh, I didn't know him. Uh, fortunately, I know him now, and, and that's been uh, one of the greatest blessings of starting this YouTube channel or creating content. But back then, I didn't know him, but I was following the journey, and I was, uh, you know, he has taught me just as much as Rick Rule, Doug Casey, or anyone else out there. Well, we have a lot of uh, a lot of friends in common. Um, I've known Rick for decades. Uh, Ron Paul is a has been on the show and is a friend of uh, the company. And um, we had John Stossel on the show. We've had... Um, uh, I've never met John. Yeah, he's, he's a very liberty-minded fellow, um, yeah. as you know. Yeah. And, and we've um, spoken with uh, lots of investors who I think would sort of categorize themselves that way. So, and, and it's, and I've met many, uh, many people over the years, many of our readers and listeners who, who would do the same. And it's always interesting to me when I meet an investor who is, you know, pretty good, pretty successful, pretty wealthy, who does not categorize themselves that way. I'm thinking to myself, you know, how did you, you know, what do you think were the conditions that allowed you to prosper? Are you, uh, you know, in league with the government somehow? Are you getting your trade ideas from Nancy Pelosi or something? What's, you know, wh wh how, how is it that you don't call yourself a libertarian or, or aren't at least highly skeptical of the role of a great central power in any economy? And I think, uh, you know, as you point out, corruption and great central power, they go together, don't they? Yeah, I don't know that I've ever met an investor that uh, wouldn't fall into the category of libertarian. Not that they'd call themselves libertarian. Most of them are, I think, would consider themselves completely atypical mm -hmm. because they're just going to do whatever is best for the bottom line. I mean, they, they don't care about anything other than number go up. Right. Uh, or, or just their monthly P&L. But... Yeah, you know, I'm thinking through all the, like the hedge fund managers that I've met uh, through my good friend Hugh Hendry and St. Bart's, and hmm. uh, by speaking at different conferences and being all over the world, I've I've been fortunate to meet a lot of those you know, guys that are maybe billionaires or at the very least have managed billions of dollars, and every single one of them, uh, pretty much politically, falls within a, a kind of a range of middle right to libertarian and and some of them are i would even consider ancaps yeah i won't name any names but i know hedge fund managers who've made tons of money are very wealthy who would, who i would probably call socialists they live in the united states really? oh yeah live in the united states huh. have an extraordinarily high standard of living benefited from capitalism etc cetera, etc cetera, and uh, they think we need a lot more government not a lot less but let's not get into that um yeah. <laughs> so, so, so we agree that it makes all kinds of sense anyway to to be a 
an investor, you know, li especially living in the United States, um, calling oneself a libertarian. Uh, does that, so as a macro addict, self-described libertarian, how much, being a macro addict, of course, you're, you're telling me something about your investment style, right? Are you telling me more about your investment style by being a libertarian? Does that really inform the investment choices or do you try to stay as sort of, uh, you know, agnostic about politics as possible when you're allocating capital? It, it, it depends. Overall, I don't think it matters, but in some areas it does. As an example, when I look at commodities, likely being in a long-term super cycle, mm. one of the, the catalysts to that is the stupidity of government. <laughs> so as my good friend Cuppy says, you, you've got to go long political stupidity. Yeah. And so I, I might not have, uh, I, I might not be as confident in that position if I wasn't so if my default wasn't government bad <laughs> right? or, you know, government's always going to do the wrong thing or there's always going to be these unintended consequences and whatever they do, there's most likely it's going to be a net negative. And especially with a the narrative they're trying to push right now, that net negative is likely going to impact the, the long term supply of the commodities that have very inelastic demand. Mm -hmm. So that would be an example of of how it might have shaped my, my views from a macro standpoint or an investing standpoint. But then when I look at something like uh, NVIDIA mm -hmm. or when I look like uh, something like Tesla, uh, that was, uh, I, I've been on a trip where I've discussed uh, this with several uh, pretty high profile investors over the last few weeks. And uh, this is a kind of a recurring theme. This, uh, one of the guys I was talking to specifically, he was mentioning uh, short Tesla, long auto uh, manufacturers, mm -hmm. uh, just to take out the, the market risk there. And what we were talking about specifically when he was using that as an example is narrative and how important story is to investing. And especially if you're trend following. And uh, so and the trend, trend following is another thing that I've been thinking about a lot lately uh, yeah. versus value investing and asking the question at the end of the day, is there a difference? And if so, what? And so those types of decisions, I don't think being a libertarian impacts them uh, at all. But uh, again, in, in some areas, it does. Right. So let's get into this trend following versus value investing thing, because I listened to a little bit of a um, – Actually, I think you recorded it live. You were live on Twitter, but um, I, I listened to a little bit of the recording where you were talking about a particular trader that you had a conversation with, I believe, in Dubai. Yeah, we won't mention. I, I don't want to mention any of the no names, the, the yeah. people. Yeah, but yeah. I'm happy to talk about the strategy. Yeah. So, but I, I found it interesting. This guy was absolutely flat out said, "Yeah, it's nice that you." You have a value orientation, but it doesn't work. I've done all the back testing, which I thought was hilarious yeah. because there are more than one data set out there that show that value has done great over the long term. But we could even forget about that. I'm just interested in this intersection that you find between what is normally called trend following. And we've had uh, market wizards and Jack Schweiger himself on the show. Um, by Man. the way, We've also My had favorite books. I've got those right over here too. Yeah, they're excellent. By the way, just quickly, we've also had Kupperman on the show twice. Harris Kupperman and uh, Hugh Hendry a couple of times too. So we have lots of lots of friends in common. A lot of, but, a lot of um, common friends here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, but let's talk about this because I was fascinated when you started talking about well, you know, the similarities between um, trend following and value investing, and I wonder if you could just sort of expound on that a little bit for our listener. Yeah, it's something I've given a lot of thought and I found the conversations that I was having the last couple of weeks absolutely fascinating. And like you said, one of them was with a guy that had been a trend following commodities since the late uh, 1990s. And he actually knew Dennis and he knew Eckert as well. Did not, yeah. not very well, but he had, I, I think he had met them before. Mm -hmm. um, anyway. Just uh, George, just for our listeners, um, William Eckert and Richard Dennis, the original sort of turtle, so-called turtle trader trend following traders who taught a whole generation of traders to do that. 
a uh, lot of That's which correct. wound up in the Market Wizards books, but please continue. Yeah, and so to your point, we're having this discussion on buying low and selling high. Mm. And we were specifically talking about Jim Rogers. And I said, okay, well, what Jim Rogers has done works. And intuitively, you know, what I always say is buy things when they're cheap and sell them when they're expensive. That makes a lot of sense. But obviously his point is, okay, well, you could have been in uranium for 10 years and it's the exact same argument and doesn't move. Or uh, silver, I think you could probably say the same thing about silver over the last five years. I don't, I don't know the chart, but I'm sure you guys know it pretty darn well. Yeah, actually. Especially when you adjust for inflation. Mm -hmm. And so the, the key there with Jim Rogers, if, if you read his books or his interview with Jack Schweiger and the original Market Wizards, he, he, he doesn't just say buy things when they're cheap and sell them when they're expensive. He always looks for a catalyst. Yep. Always. There has to be a catalyst. And so the conclusion that I came to with this gentleman is at the end of the day, everyone's a trend follower. Everybody. Jim Rogers is a trend follower. It's just what he is doing is trying to pick up at a trend at its very beginning stages by first and foremost looking for value, but then looking for that catalyst. And I would argue what differentiates the successful value investors from the ones that have poor performance is the successful value investor doesn't just look for uh, you know half a cigarette butt or cigar butt to go back to Benjamin Graham. Uh, they don't really look at something that just because it has a four PE, I'm going to go ahead and buy it. Or even because if there's a fundamental story, I'm going to go ahead and buy it. They always look for a catalyst in addition to the value being there. And effectively what they're doing is they're trying to just catch a trend at its very beginning stages where the stereotypical trend follower might just be happy to catch the, the middle portion of the trend where a guy like Rogers is going to pick up the whole thing, but with his investment style, he's going to have to use money management and risk management in a much different way to be successful over the long run and have a mathematical edge. Right. If I wanted to, I could, I could, I could take issue with this at length, but I don't think I want to right now. Uh, I would just say something like, you know, all the value investors I know who are really hardcore value investors, they don't care about price trends at all. You know, they just buy what is attractively valued and they, you know, research the asset or company or whatever it is from the bottom up. Um, and, you know, they hold on for a while and they make decisions. If they're down after a while, maybe they made a mistake. But um, I would yeah, rather but, but, focus on this, but, the, on the, go ahead. Yeah, but also you can look at that because a value investor is going to look at it from the short side as well. I mean, you look at yeah. guys like Einhorn, yep. uh, who has done better recently, yep. but just got crushed uh, in the mid 2000s, call it 2012 or whatever, to 2019. Mm -hmm. And you got a guy like Chanos, yep. uh, one of the most brilliant investors of, of our day, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had to shut down his fund because basically Tesla, among other things, uh, put him out of business. Why? because he was sitting there shorting Tesla based on the valuation instead of waiting for a catalyst. Uh, same thing with Einhorn, mm -hmm. you know, during that, that time frame from 2012, to 2019, he's specifically focusing on PE ratios value and just waiting for the market to see what he sees. And it got to the point where it, it wasn't working well. And another thing, I think it <laughs> depends on the individual's priorities and what your objectives are. Right. Mm -hmm. So if you're someone that's got $20 million in the bank and your main concern is just keeping your port, your purchasing power and maybe very low drawdowns, value investing makes a lot of sense. But if you're a fund manager that has to worry about your monthly P&L, oh, yeah. you can't go five years waiting for uranium to turn the corner. You, you, you're you're, you're going to lose all your investors in your AUM. Sure, sure. And we, we know that value had a terrible run against, you know, technology and other things uh, throughout the recent um, extraordinarily long record bull market. Um, but I'm, I'm more interested in the confluence of the two because um, a uh, colleague at an affiliate of ours is uh, Mark Chaikin. And he's got this thing he calls the power gauge, which 
I thought I took for granted before I found out what it was, that it was some sort of a momentum trading tool. But he said, no, Dan, 85% of it is fundamental <laughs> indicators. So I thought, oh, well, that's very interesting. You know, it sort of reminded me of um, like Walter Schloss, one of the Ben Graham um, students who just bought statistical value for years and years and years and held on for two or three years and sold and made plenty of money. Um, mm. and, and, and other, other folks did that too. And then, you know, after a while that became more difficult, of course, but the idea of the two of them being so similar, um, is, yeah, is but even those value investors at the end of the day, they're trend following because they're, what they're looking <laughs> for is just to cut, cut their losers and ride their winners, which that's a trend. Sure. Yeah. In a way, it is, um, but of course, the but the trend followers, though the real ones, the ones in Schreiger's book, like they were traditionally. I don't know what they might be doing now, but traditionally, though, they're only trading price, and they never cared about fundamentals. They only mm. focused on price movements, and they waited until in the beginning with Dennis and Eckhart. I think they were trading like twenty-one day breakouts or something, uh, among other things. Right? They did they did various strategies, but. Um, Whereas, you know, your value guy, he, he doesn't even know there's a break. He doesn't even care. <laughs> you know, the stock could be down 50% and he's thinking, oh, okay, this is a great idea. And it, you know, could fall another 20% and you think, oh, it's even better. Um, so the idea that the two have any kind of a crossover has become much more interesting to me over the past few years, just because I've seen people use, and I've always been skeptical, like if you're good at one thing, you're going to be good at the other. But the more I hear people talk about the confluence of the two, the more interested I get. And I think you, you've you talked about it, them being, you're talking about them being sort of the same thing though, which I yeah. find really interesting because I know yeah, personally, the, I, I don't care about the chart. I just care about the business mostly. The, the best hedge fund managers I know, uh, and there's, one in particular that I, I spend a lot of time with when I'm in St. Bart's. And in fact, I was just <laughs> with him over the weekend and we spent a lot of time uh, dissecting this on, um, on Monday, actually. What they do is they start with a macro view and then they'll look at the fundamentals. And then if they get interested in the fundamental, and by the way, one of the, the main drivers of I don't know if you want to call it the fundamentals, but their decision-making is narrative. And, and if the story changes around something, and as an example, you know, why, why did, when Chanos was sitting there shorting Tesla, he was doing it based on valuation and he, he was exactly right. I mean, he was right, but the only thing that changed, it's not like the valuation now is any worse. And that's why Tesla has gone down. Uh, if anything, uh, the valuation is better, but now the stock's going down. Why? Because the narrative and the actual story changed. So anyway, getting back to uh, this one gentleman in particular, uh, he'll start with a macro view. Then he'll go down with a fundamental approach. As an example, commodities. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if he thinks that uh, long term, let's just assume that the 2020s are going to be inflationary and he holds the same view that I do about the central planners. Not that he does, but let's just assume that he does. He'd start with that premise and then he'd go down and say, okay, fundamentally, what commodities do I want to own right now? And uh, then he'd set up long-term positions and then he trades around those long-term positions. And then what he does to kind of go into the timing of it, that's when he looks at the charts. So then he'll look at, uh, as an example, uh, back uh, a few months ago, we were there and he was trying to analyze the TLT. Mm -hmm. And so it, he wasn't just, oh, hey, I think the Fed's going to drop rates and I think we're going to go into going into a recession and therefore I'm going to buy the TLT. He was like, no, first of all, let's look at a chart. Let's see how the, the price action is moving. And then it's not just long TLT. Then he's trying to figure out how he wants to place the bet in the way that maximizes asymmetry. Mm -hmm. And this is another thing that the retail investor just doesn't do yeah. that um, this, this gentleman in particular does. I, I would say if he's allocating 100% of his mental bandwidth to a specific trade, 10% of it 
is what to buy or sell. And the other 90% is how to position himself and how to put on the bet. So um, it, it's, it's how to use options as an example, just mm-hmm. one of the strategies that he uses to make sure that he's limiting his downside and maximizing his upside. And he's, and he's deciding in advance where he's going to get out and take a breather and reassess his fundamental view. And that this is, you know, most retail investors, I would argue, spend 99% of their time trying to figure out what to buy or what not to buy. And they spend 1% of their time on the portfolio management, the money management, or the risk management. Yep. And from what I can tell, the pros do the exact opposite. Yep. In fact, I'd like to get your guys' opinion on this. Yeah. One of the conclusions that I've come to reading the market wizards books as many times as I have, especially the originals is what made these guys great had nothing to do with their ability to determine what was going to happen in the future, whether it was with a stock, whether it was with a, a a macro event, commodity prices, the the British pound, you name it. It was all about them figuring out the risk management component of it and the money management component and the portfolio construction. So it, what that boils down to is cutting your losses and riding your winners. And I got to the point or where I am now, and my opinion could evolve in the future, but I'll bet you if they would have just had a coin toss, they would have had the exact same outcome, if not yep. maybe even a, a better outcome. And the only thing their strategy did, I'm talking specifically about their strategy in picking stocks or picking what to buy or sell. The only thing that did is just give them an excuse to pull the trigger. Yep. And then apply the money management and the risk management that in the, that was what was actually making them money. And the reason I say that is because obviously now we've got a lot more data to analyze what they were uh, what they were seeing back in the late 80s and the early 90s when these books were written Mm -hmm. and I I sit there and and listen to what they were saying and what drove a lot of their decision-making. And it was nonsense. It was nonsense. Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with what they thought it had to do with, but yet they were still producing 20% returns per year. I remember specifically, and I I don't want to knock a Druckenmiller, obviously he's a genius and, but uh, specifically his interview and some of the things that he was talking about, we know now today mm-hmm. that those things really didn't impact uh, the dollar. Actually, I should take that back because I don't know if it was Druckenmiller or someone else, but as an example, they were talking about the twin deficits mm-hmm. and they were talking about how the twin deficits with the United States and a lot of the things that they talk about today uh, with the deficits and the, 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 uh, uh, not just the deficits, excuse me, but the government debt and whatnot and how this is completely unsustainable and how that was going to be negative for the dollar. What we know back then that that really didn't impact the dollar too much, but yet they're making all these decisions as though it did. And even though mechanically it didn't, they still came out smelling like roses. Well, how was that? If they're, <laughs> if right. they're, the basis of their strategy was incorrect, it's because of all these other things that the retail investor doesn't pay any attention to. Right. Yeah, we wind, we we always wind up here when when the subject is trading. Um, yeah, Dan, I know you're thinking the same. I'm yeah. thinking the same thing you are. Like we every every good uh, investor who comes on here, which is you know all of them, but the like explains the risk management piece of it, eventually right. gets to the risk management piece, like uh, weighing the the reward versus the risk. And it's you're right. It's a lot. It's Nobody and they, most of the retail investors never get to that point. Um, but the funny thing yeah, they is, they try to decide if, if the price is going up or down. And it, but right. I, I want to make one more or re-emphasize one more point because I think it's so important for your listeners. Is even if you come to the conclusion and you do your your risk management, your money management, whatnot, even if you come to the conclusion that you should go long, whatever uh, uranium, let's say. The, the pros don't just go long uranium. They take it another oh, yeah. step where they say, how should I go long uranium? Not just buying the Sprott Trust, not that they wouldn't just buy the Sprott Trust, but I'm just using it as an example. They would sit there and say, okay, that's one option, but does that give me the most asymmetry? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. And then they'll sit there and look at uh, 
you know, maybe with some other examples, they might look at futures, they might look at options. And with options, they'll look at like 50 different of these crazy strategies going all over the place, things that I had never even heard of or never even thought of to express that bet. Mm -hmm. So that also is one of the things that differentiates the pros from the amateurs. Yeah. And it's funny, not only, not only do we always wind up here, um, at, at risk management and portfolio management, but it, it's funny how many times we get to this point and the guest will say in a very offhand way, and that's more important than anything. <laughs> they, well, maybe we should have start, maybe we should just start there every time because they always wind up saying, yeah, that's more important than anything. Yeah, you know, you I, just start I, with I, it's not sexy. It's, it's not yeah. sexy. It's not sexy. No, it's not. And that's why that's the boring part. And yeah. that's why the retail investor struggles with that so much. You know, yeah. one thing that I would, um, another epiphany I've had mm -hmm. is what these pros do essentially is they try to create blackjack. So what I mean by that is if you've counted cards, and that's one of the reasons why I've got beat the dealer up here behind me. <laughs> yeah. What what you see is that there's what we call basic strategy. So basic strategy is just if the dealer is showing this and I've got this, this is the correct play based on the probabilities. Now you might lose, you might win. It doesn't really matter as long as you're playing correctly based on the probabilities. And that gives you basically a 50-50, uh, maybe a slight disadvantage to the dealer. But mm -hmm. when you combine that with actually counting cards, and all that is, is just seeing if the deck is in your favor or if the deck is against you, then you fluctuate your bets. So if the deck's in your favor, you're still playing basic strategy, you're gonna bet more. And if the deck is against you based on the count, then you're gonna bet less. But what happens is your, your downside in blackjack is defined. Each and every bet, you're, you're betting 10 bucks or whatever. So the maximum you can lose is 10 bucks. But what's interesting is you can hit a blackjack and that you can make a lot more than your $10 back. Mm -hmm. So there's asymmetry. Yep. And when I'm sitting there watching these hedge fund managers put on all their trades, all I'm thinking to myself, because it's absolutely true, is they're just trying to take the trading game and turn it into blackjack as much as they can. And the more they can turn it into blackjack, the higher the mathematical edge is, and therefore it's a, a, um, it's the large numbers, mm -hmm. right? The more you trade, the higher your probability that you're gonna win. Basically, you're just turning yourself into the house in a casino. Right, so yeah, and we, we talk to you know market wizards and other traders, they say, well, you know, I make money on less than half my trades. And most people shake their heads at that and go, how, how in the world do you do that? Obviously, the reason that you just said, you, you know, you make asymmetry. more, yep, that asymmetry. You, you lose less and, and make a lot more when you make money. In other words, blackjack. Yep. That's a, that's a good way to put it. We've never had anybody put it in exactly that way. That's, that's, yeah, haven't heard the blackjack reference yet. So that's Yeah, good. I think I've got um, why that's my default is because that's where I started. Uh, back in, this would have been 2000, uh, when I was kind of getting going as an entrepreneur, I, I don't even know how, but I stumbled across Beat the Dealer and I was fascinated. I didn't really want to play blackjack or anything, but I was going through how he laid out the probabilities and basic strategy and all these things. Mm -hmm. I'm like, you know, that's really interesting that, that you can beat the game by just doing these things that gives you, that takes the mathematical edge away from the casino and puts it in favor of the player. Hmm. And so what I did is uh, on the weekend, whenever I got any time, I would go to the local casino. And this was at the time I was in San Francisco. So it was just one of these Indian casinos up north. Mm -hmm. And I would literally sit there for eight hours straight, but I wouldn't fluctuate my bet because I didn't want them to kick me out. So I would just sit there and practice basic strategy for hours on end to the point where the pit bosses would come up to me and say, you know, I have never in my life seen anyone stay at a table for eight hours straight and, and not fluctuate their bet, not do anything. And they probably knew I was, I was practicing, but they didn't care if I wasn't fluctuating my bet because you don't really have an edge. Mm -hmm. 
And the, the reason I was doing that is to train my brain to think in terms of probabilities. Mm -hmm. And I always credit my success as an entrepreneur to Blackjack <laughs> and to Ed Thorpe beat the dealer and that experience. Because then when I, and at the time I was kind of a fledgling uh, entrepreneur, didn't make any money. But then when I started to make money, I, I looked at sales and marketing the same way. So I thought to myself, okay, I've just got to turn this into a game of probabilities. And so if I can uh, set up a closing ratio at X and maintain that, and then I can do all of these other things that uh, turn these other variables into predictable metrics, then all I have to do is focus exclusively on lead generation. And then it's just a numbers game. The more people that I bring in through the front door, the higher the gross revenue is going to be. And if, uh, you know, the, uh, the majority of my costs are fixed, then that's going to increase my margins. And then all I have to do is just spend more and more and more money on marketing and refine that process. And the rest is just going to take care of itself. And that's when I went from kind of just struggling to making quite a bit of money uh, to the point where I was able to retire at uh, 38 in 2012. Nice. That's great. Yeah. Um, George, so, I just want to go back for a second to your, your mac, the macro view, right? You know, of governments be equal bad, right? Um, I've heard you say, you know, you dislike all governments equally, yeah, and, and you're for the basically for the people. That's um, right. What do like? What are the essentials that the the people may not understand about this financial system, this global financial system that we're in? That you kind of when you went down the rabbit hole like started to understand like, whoa, this is, you know, we're being affected here by things that I, most of us aren't aware of. The number one thing people don't understand is money. They don't understand the, they don't understand how it's created. They don't understand how it dis it's destroyed. Uh, they don't understand who controls it. Um, there's a total and complete disconnect and the, and it's understandable because the way the monetary system works is incredibly counterintuitive to the point where I would argue 99.9% .9 of the experts uh, that I talk to don't understand it. Uh, and the, the problem that most people have is they think that banks lend money. And if that's your starting point, you're going to get the whole thing wrong. There, there, there's no way you can get it right. So what you have to do is your starting point can't be the banks lend money. It has to be the banks create money when they lend. And if you can just get that down, although that doesn't explain you know, everything, that gives you the key to unlock the doors to where if you go down that path for let's say a year or two, you're gonna have a better understanding of the monetary system than 99% of the experts that you would see on YouTube or uh, maybe even a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well put. Uh, so George, we are, it's time for our final question. And um, I'm really, oh my gosh. I'm very happy. It did go fast. It often does. Um, you know, when the conversation is this good, it always whips by, but our final question is the same for every guest, no matter what the topic, even if it's a non-financial topic. And, um, exact same question and if you have already said the answer to the question by all means feel free to repeat it and the question is simply if you could leave our listener with a single thought today uh, what would you like that to be that you have the power you have the power and i'm talking to every one of your listeners the only thing that prevents you and your fellow citizens from winning against the central planners and the authoritarians is you guys just coming together as a community. That's it. That's it. Because at the end of the day, there's far more of us than there is of them. And I always use the story of Romania uh, when communism was falling in the, the 1990s. At the time, they had a dictator. I believe his name was Ceausescu. Mm -hmm. I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yep. And he had ruled the country with an iron hand for decades. He controlled everything. 
He controlled the military. He controlled the police. He controlled the media. He controlled all the wealth. Absolutely everything. But what happened is a few people got fed up and they saw what was happening around them in other countries and they started going out to the streets. Now, it is true. They were risking being shot or risking going to jail or any of these things. But it got to a point where they didn't care. And once a few people went out, then other people saw what they were doing and more people joined them to the point where there were so many people that the police really couldn't do anything about it. Now, I don't know what the population was of Romania at the time, but I do know that it only took about 500,000 people, roughly, pushing back because it got to a point where all these, let's say it's called them protesters, like the truckers in Canada, mm. exact same thing. Yep. And, and I would actually compare Trudeau to Ceausescu yeah. <laughs> at the end of the day. But it, it just was a, a matter of all these people coming together, which was a small percentage of the overall population. It's not like it was 95% of the people, but they came together because they had enough and they decided that they were going to push back against the oppressors. They were going to push back against the central planners and the authoritarians. They weren't going to take it anymore. So they went out to the, the square, and Ceausescu came out and tried to settle them down by raising his hand like he had always done in the past, and they basically got even louder. And then he did it again, and they got even louder. And he knew right then and there that he was done. It was he over. was done. Yeah. And nine days later, roughly, they basically took him out back and shot him. So and I'm not condoning violence or, of, of in any way, shape, or form, mm -hmm. but I'm just using that as a story to prove to people that at the end of the day, you have the power. Klaus doesn't. The World Economic Forum, they don't. Yeah. The UN, the EU, the Biden administration, the, the Canadian government, at the end of the day, if you don't want them to have power, you have the ability to take that away from them as long as you come together with your fellow citizens and stand up for freedom, liberty, and free market capitalism. Well put, and what a great message. Very empowering message on a topic where people don't feel especially empowered, I think. But George, thanks a lot for being here, man. I really, really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me, guys. It's always fun to talk. The Fed wants you to believe they've got inflation under control, but I believe we've only seen the beginning of a devastating new crisis. And if you don't prepare now, you could see your savings evaporate as inflation and interest rates soar even higher over the next two years. It all traces back to a golden thread that ties together the biggest financial calamities in America's history. But it seems the entire financial world is falling into this very same denial trap that led to massive devastation the last time this crisis played out. If you know your history, you know there will be winners and losers, and now is when you decide which one you'll be. I've spelled it all out in an urgent new report. Go to www.bankrun2024.com to get your free copy. I'll also show you how to get my complete playbook for navigating this crisis, including the three critical steps to take immediately. Again, that's www.bankrun2024.com for your free copy of my new report. Hey, that was interesting. Um, I never, I've never heard anybody say that trend following and value investing are the same thing. <laughs> like ever <laughs> yeah i mean I, and i know what he's what he you know i know you, you thought a little differently of that and i get what he's saying though as far as you know it's part of i guess it can be they can commingle i guess mm -hmm. and uh so i understand that part of it it's just yeah. nice to hear as kind of a different conversation than we've had recently and just George, the thing that I, I watch his videos are on rebel Cap capitalist and he's just able to explain and articulate kind of things going on in the global financial system in a way that I haven't heard other people a way. I, I wish I could be able to explain it. And it was interesting to hear him at the beginning explain that he knew, you know, nothing at, at one point and his path into it. And that was the same as me. I'm still learning a lot. Um, but that the point being that you can figure this stuff out, you know, um, don't really trust, um, you know, 
everything that you, that you hear out there. You got to kind of do the work yourself and figure it out. And also another thing I think I want to emphasize for listeners, George has that dogged determinism of an entrepreneur. Like the thought of him sitting at a blackjack table for eight hours, never changing his bet. I'm like, yeah, I feel like I know this guy, I, you know, and good investors <laughs> yeah. are the same way. I mean, they'll, they'll fly across the world, you know, um, <clears throat> to to do basic research on an investment opportunity and it's the same kind of mentality just like dig in up to your eyeballs let's get it done get your hands dirty and uh you know it it bears fruit it's like the only way to it's the only way to really succeed in life you know is to just take it on and do whatever needs to be done and i, I love that i love the idea of him sitting at that table for eight hours never changing his bet <laughs> Just to figure out the risk reward, which yeah. uh, uh, again, that point that came up and, uh, you know, something different that he said was when reading through the market wizards books, like it didn't really matter what the thesis was that all these guys were talking about as long right. as they managed the risk correctly. So it's like, yeah. what does that tell you? It tells you a lot about what the most important piece is um, practically. I get, you know, and it makes sense. We're talking about numbers and making money and, you know, trading. That's in yeah. the end, it comes down to the, comes down to the, the prices and the numbers, but it, you got a lot of, you can find the, find the right opportunities in different ways and then, right. and then manage it. Um, yeah, accordingly, that there so. is a, that there is a systematic approach, I think probably wouldn't, um, probably doesn't surprise anyone but like you said you know most investors they try to be systematic about the wrong end of the trade you know they're they're systematically yeah. or otherwise maybe not so systematically trying to figure out what to buy instead of how to buy it and how to manage the position which is what every great investor on this show has basically emphasized um you know it, it's uh there's a system, but it's not the one that you think. It's this boring system of, you know, basically letting winners run and, and cutting losers in some particular fashion. And and George even said, I don't know if I've said it. I hope I've said it, but I've definitely thought it, that it seems like you could almost flip a coin and and trade anything at any moment. And as long as you keep, have this good system for cutting your losers and letting your winners run, you're probably going to do okay. And he said, you may even do better than the market wizards, which I thought, yeah. you know, it's funny. It could be true. Who knows? But yeah. that was, a, that was a lot of fun. We're definitely going to have George back. Yeah. You should definitely have him back. Yeah. All right. Well, that's another interview and that's another episode of the Stansberry Investor Hour. I hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Opinions expressed on this program are solely those of the contributor and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Stansbury Research, its parent company, or affiliates.